The most frequent question I get asked about Distal is, how is it different from D&D? Totally makes sense. Fair question. Given that you can't even talk about a D20 system without at least bringing Dungeons and Dragons into the equation. That being said, let's talk about what Distal does differently. Hey there folks, Rel here. Today I'd like to share six differences that set Distal apart from Dungeons and Dragons. But first, we need to look at the design philosophy. Every core mechanic in Distal is vetted by three separate criteria, the first of which is that it must create meaningful decisions for the player. The second is that it must not create unnecessary cognitive load. The third is that it must serve the story or the themes of the game. If even one of these aren't true, then we throw out the mechanic or we rework it. Oh, and for those who don't know, Distal is currently on Backerkit. You can pull down the Alpha Core Rules, a quick start guide, and a beginner's adventure totally free. Play the game right now at playdisrpg.com. In Distal, backstories are a very important part of your character creation. So important, in fact, that we put them as one of the first things that you'll be doing when creating a new character. Backstories are written by the player, and they provide both mechanical benefits and narrative hooks that ground you in Distal's world. The way we do this is by having you fill in two sentences with four separate prompts, ad lib style. You can roll on the tables to end up with a random prompt, something that we highly suggest that you do at least once, or you can pick from the prompts, the ones that call to you, the ones that you're most interested in. The level of specificity is super important in a system like this because we want to unlock your creativity. If you're too vague, if you'd give somebody just a word, it might paralyze the writer because of the amount of choices that they can make. And then usually we default to something that is tropey and familiar. We don't want that. At the same time, if you go too specific, then you don't really give the writer any room for creativity. You can't interpret the outcome. So the way that we do it in Distal is very specific and hopefully it does unlock your creativity. Character creation in Distal uses the following two sentences. I grew up, prompt and my days were spent, prompt. I became, prompt, the day, prompt. Maybe my character grew up during a time of war and their days were spent attending fancy gatherings. Maybe they became a sellsword the day that they were revealed as a charlatan. Again, these are all prompts that you can roll up on a table or you can pick the ones from the table that you feel most comfortable with. That being said, how do you imagine that this particular character would play out? What immediately pops to your mind? What do you envision? You can let me know in the comments section down below and we can figure out how different all of our separate visions are between the commenters. Distal is, at its core, a game about enduring hardship and living with the consequences. Sometimes that hardship can come in the form of a brush with death. Each time you begin dying, which is when you're reduced to zero hit points, you'll begin accruing death marks. Death marks are permanent. If you take on too many, then you embrace the sweet forever sleep. Allies can stabilize a dying character with medicinal aid or magical healing, but you will be forever changed. And also, it takes somebody a number of rounds to wake up from being stabilized based on how many death marks that they have. So no yo-yo healing, which is something that I personally despise in D&D. After the battle, assuming you survive it, you'll need to scratch off a number of skills equal to the number of death marks that you took on. Skills are proficiencies in Distal, and they're independent from your core attributes. You might have a plus four in stealth, which is the highest that you can get, or a plus two in aid, or a plus three to engineering. But when you take on a death mark, you have to scratch off a pip from a skill that you know. That plus four to stealth might become a plus two. Which skills you decide to scratch off are up to you, as is the narrative that you use to describe them. Maybe your perception is diminished now that you have a big scar over your eye, or maybe your charming good looks have burned and soured the influential bridges that were once afforded to you. Regardless, it will be a reminder that your character has been forever changed. That said, it's not all bad. We don't want to death spiral your character, so the maximum number of death marks that you can accrue increases as you gain in level. And again, while they're permanent, you can still create a little bit of cushion for yourself should you fall again. You can also acquire certain specializations, which are like feats in 5e, that require you to have a certain amount of death marks accumulated before you can take them on. The most important thing though is that every time you accrue a death mark, yes, you're gonna scratch off a skill, but your maximum health increases by one. This will make you a little less likely to fall over the next time. So Distal is heavily class-based, but unlike Dungeons and Dragons, that has to be very broad, very kind of templatized. The classes need to support many different playstyles in many different settings. 
Distal aims to be more specific. For example, the Justicar class touches on a paladin-like fantasy, but the Justicar themselves are wielded by many of the competing religious institutions throughout the Distal to enforce their views and defend their faith. Different cultures even have different versions of Justicar, but they might be called something different. So the Dwarven kingdoms refer to their Justicar equivalent as Bremengard, and the Bremengard as an act of devotion, they have their eyes removed and replaced with magical opals. However, classes don't adhere to traditional roles. They might lean one way or the next, but depending on your equipment, depending on the choices that you make during development, they can all be built toward a playstyle that you enjoy playing. Every two levels, you receive a specialization, which is again like a feat in 5e, and every three levels, your class takes on three signatures, and each of those signatures tend to lean toward a specific role. For example, as a berserker, you could gain some light healing capabilities by creating a rune mark across the ground, and any time that you take damage, the allies who are in that rune mark would receive some healing. Or they can be more stealthy, moving quickly while behind cover and ambushing targets from concealed locations. Or you can build them to be more survivable, so when you eat the damage from an incoming attack intentionally, you can reduce it by your fortitude. These are just a few different options, but there are so many that you can make as you build up a character. You could play three separate characters using the same class totally differently, and there wouldn't be any conflicts. Alright, so I've done a video on this one in the past, but I wholeheartedly believe that we can do monsters better than D&D does them right now by making one major change. Monsters in Distal use behaviors instead of the traditional action economy. Characters are run by players, and players want granular control over their characters' actions. It's what allows them to play tactically. It's what allows them to express their characters' capabilities. But a GM has a whole lot more going on at any given time. So we limit a monster to one singular behavior per turn. That acts as a streamlined, flavorful equivalent to a character's turn economy without getting bogged down in the granularity of it all. Most monsters have four different behaviors that you can choose from, or you can roll on the table if you're feeling fancy. The first behavior tends to be a basic attack, while the remaining behaviors tend to be more flavorful, thematic, to the monster. We want each monster to have a reason to exist. It needs to be easy to run, easy to build encounters for, and it needs to be fun to fight against. Take a look at the stat block for the Bow Wolf, just as an example. The stat block is pretty compact, flavorful, uses less technical language because we know that the GM is going to be the one using these monsters, which means that we can establish some shortcuts right up front. For example, when we say in reach, we expect all monsters to have five feet of reach unless otherwise stated. This saves us space and gives us more room to convey flavor through the behavior description. Let's go one by one through the behavior so you can see how the monster comes together. Bow wolves can tendon rip as a basic attack, which deals some damage and pins the target if an ally is also within five feet of them. They have Feral Baying, which can encumber enemies within 30 feet, and encumber just doubles the cost of movement, but if they're already encumbered, when they fail that check, they become pinned. If they're already pinned, they become slowed. So imagine a pack of wolves all howling. It's freaking terrifying. The effect builds on itself and also has synergy with their default attack. The next behavior is stalk, which just lets them become hidden. Having one or more wolves doing this can feel like you're really being hunted, which is a big part of the fantasy of fighting or fleeing from a pack of wolves. Lastly, they have pack work, which allows them to basically bring an ally with them at no movement cost to that ally. That gives them the ability to surround opponents very quickly and use tendon rip, which means that it can set their allies up to pin victims. So all of these abilities have synergy, and they all build on one another, and that means a few different things. The first of which is that you can make an interesting encounter from just a singular creature, which is not something that is easily done in 5e. The second is that you have less things to track overall, which, again, makes it easier to run. The third of which is that the players will have fun fighting the creature as its behaviors are unveiled. So. The deeper you get into combat, the more capabilities that you see the creature take advantage of, and then the combat itself becomes more dynamic. That'll make your players feel really smart when they figure out how to deal with the main threat. So that bit about monsters was pretty heavy, so let's try something a little bit more lighthearted. Companion pets in the distal have what is affectionately referred to as plot armor. People generally don't like it when their pets end up getting hurt, 
And while I understand that perspective, I also want to make sure that there's some underpinning gameplay logic that a player can lean on so that everything kind of feels above board. To that end, we introduce plot armor, which are very specific circumstances that pets can use to become immune to damage and wholly ignored by enemies during combat. For example, the falconer's raptor companion simply needs to occupy the falconer's space in order to receive plot armor. What's more is that a raptor will automatically attempt to return to the falconer's space at the end of your turn. We also protect pets in other ways as well. For example, if that same raptor companion would drop to zero health, it would enter a dying state similar to a character. A companion can't be executed and it can be stabilized just like a character can via magical healing or medicinal aid. That said, if that's not available, then the companion's owner can sacrifice a death mark to immediately stabilize that creature. When it comes to matters of life and death, everything has a cost. The last difference that I'll leave you with is willpower. When combat starts, all characters receive one willpower. If you miss an attack or if you fail a check against a negative spell or effect, you can push that roll further by rolling your willpower die. It consumes the willpower, but you get to add that bonus to your check. This helps you, potentially, reverse failure, but it's a choice, and willpower is a limited resource that also depletes at the end of combat. But whenever an enemy dies, every character in the party receives a willpower. If you complete a sub-objective, same thing. Everybody in the party gets a willpower. The real magic behind willpower is that it helps get around that feel-bad moment when you miss a couple of attacks on a turn and then you feel like you've wasted the whole turn. If you have willpower when you roll, then it feels like you have a choice that you could correct. You need to figure out how important it is to push that roll, but that's up to you. As combat goes on, creatures will die, and then you can burn that willpower making attacks against the remaining creatures, which in turn can build more willpower. It's a momentum mechanic that helps you avoid the cleanup phase at the end of combat, when the scales are tipped in your favor and you know you're going to win, it's way better to end that combat quickly than it is for it to just drag on and roll a bunch of misses on d20s that nobody feels good about. Willpower helps get you there faster. So those are six differences that help set Distal apart, but there are plenty, plenty more. Distal is being built from the ground up to be familiar enough to move your existing table to, but wholly different in theme, tone, mechanics, and who you're supporting. If this video has been interesting, helpful, or entertaining, please feel free to like, subscribe, tell your friends about the channel. And if you are interested in meaningful stakes, or you like any of the mechanics that we talked about in this video, or if you're just looking for a really good excuse to leave the Hasbro Wizards of the Coast ecosystem, then give Distal a try. Thanks very much, folks. We're all signing off.